Will all the king's horses and all the king's men be able to get Cranky the F750 running again? Did the injectors fix it? Why were the injectors bad? Why is it have red fuel? Is it gonna start? This one even has a surprise ending. I don't think anyone was expecting. Hey guys, morning. Monday morning here, and we have Cranky behind us. So today we're going to be putting the injectors in, running the overhead, and replacing the regulator on the back of the cylinder head. So let's get on with it. Alrighty, so the first thing we're gonna be doing is cleaning out our injector bores. Now Cat tells you to run all sorts of brushes and bristles down these injector bores, but I'm gonna tell you on these common oil engines, they are already clean. All you need to do is really spray some brake clean or solvent down them, and then you're gonna evacuate any excess fuel or cleaning materials out of the cylinders. Now this is a Snap-on branded, but it's an OTC made just brake bleeder that I put a little brake tube on, and it's gonna evac all that fluid out. Now, our ne first step before we put the injectors in, we run the overhead. And what I'm trying to do here is the C7Ss are very difficult to pin because the pin location on the flywheel housing is very difficult to get to, so I'm trying to get the valve overlap. Watch this. When the exhaust is coming up and the intake is going down, that means you're in valve overlap, which means time to run the overhead. Now, one of the questions I got the most in the previous video was why is the fuel red? Now, of course, most of, course, most of you know Red fuel is dyed because it's non-taxed. It's off-road only fuel. Obviously, this is an on-highway truck, so why is it running red fuel? Well, it's a county truck. And county trucks are with the government, and of course the government does not need to pay taxes to itself, so that's why it's running red fuel. So let's get back to our overhead that we are running here. We are 15 thousandths on the intake, which are the short ones. And folks, that is not a light drag. That is really loose. All the valve settings are really loose on this. So since they're all loose, we're gonna be adjusting, not just checking. Now, if you know how I run valves, I don't usually use a wrench. I usually use a torque wrench with a torque adapter, like this. Now this is a 3406E, and unfortunately we're working on a C7S with a valve cover base on, so I can't use the torque adapter. There's just no room. So we're gonna tighten it to what is close to 22 foot-pounds. I'm talking about the lock nut here. And then we'll go and torque it after. Now, I've tightened things to 22 foot-pounds more than once in my life, so we're gonna get it pretty close and then just check it after. These are not head bolts, remember, folks. You don't have to torque the heck out of the lock nut. It's just there to hold it in place. Now, we're gonna be torquing them after just to verify, and hopefully it moves just a little bit or clicks immediately, which is of course what's happening here. Now, of course, after you do half the valves, which we're doing here, you have to rotate the engine, one full rotation, then do the other half, starting on number one cylinder. Unlike before, I was doing number six. Now, of course, we're pulling the rags out because we're done with our overhead. And what we're gonna be doing here is lubricating the top of the injector bores. And the reason you wanna do this is because the injectors have O-rings, and O-rings against bare metal can catch and damage themselves or cut, which is not what you want. Now, a question I got a lot is, why did the injectors go bad in the first place? Well, no one knows for sure, but I'm gonna bet poor maintenance. These filters, which aren't cat, are so old that the part numbers are basically weathered off of them. The customer didn't even know it had a fuel water separator. Fuel water separator element on the inside is pretty nasty. You can see sediment, dirt on it. Yes, folks, you need to replace your fuel filters. So we're gonna lubricate those with clean engine oil, and then we're gonna lubricate the injector O-rings themselves. It just helps them slide in. Perkins, for some reason, tells you not to lubricate them, but I'm not a big fan of Perkins, so don't listen to them. So once these are lubricated, we are pretty much ready to install them. Now, these injectors have a little alignment pin and we'll be talking about that in a second so here's our hold down notice it says c9 and c7 i mentioned that in the previous video the c7 needs to face up if you're working on a c7 and it needs to face down and the c9 face up if you're working on a c9 so really what you're looking for when you're doing this is the alignment dowel pin bore in the head which is that little guy 
and then the one on the injector, and you want those to line up because that pin on the injector needs to go into the bore. That helps it align with the quill tube, which we'll also be showing you how to install. Once it is in place, you can see it right there. You're just gonna push it in with your bare hands. It is not very difficult to do. You should get the nice click sound that it's in. If it's not aligned, there's gonna be destruction, and you know what that means. Part one of our destruction of the week is a follow-up from a couple weeks ago where Kenyon had sent pictures of a 3500 that had thrown a rod, destroyed the block, major damage. Well, this is a video. You can see really bad destruction here. It is, he said it was about a million dollar repair for all told. And we have a submission from Chris. Hey, it's a Cummins. <laughs> Cummins destruction here. And this is what they call a window block. You can see right through it. Apparently the wrist pin came apart after a rebuild. Yeah, uh, pretty much destroyed folks. Two thrown rod videos here. I uh, hope you enjoyed these. Let's get back to actually repairing an engine. So once the injectors are in, you can now install your new injector hold down bolts. The spec on these just says use standard torque. This is an eight millimeter bolt with a hex drive head. Those get torqued to 21 foot pounds. So you noticed I had some grease there on the drive socket. I use that to help hold the socket inside the head. Sometimes they'll fall out and it's tight quarters in here. So like to do that, doesn't hurt anything. And we're just gonna torque it. 21 foot pounds. I like to torque it with a torque wrench, not tighten it with a wrench and then go back with a torque wrench. And these bolts, as I said, are new. Cat does not recommend reusing any injector hold down bolts on any other engines as far as I know. Now, once those are in, we get to the point where the quill tubes need installed. Now, notice there's some dirt on the cylinder head here. Remember, I washed off the rail and got as much dirt out of this as I could. And notice that alignment dial, that needs to face up to align in the head to keep this quill tube from rotating when you put the quill tube nut on. Now, what about the dirt here? Do you want to spray it off or anything? That's a tough question. I do not. And the reason is the bore where the quilt tube goes into feeds directly into the injector and into the cylinder. So if you do spray it off, it's very likely going to get into that bore, which means it's gonna get into the injector and into the cylinder head and into the cylinder. Now you could try to put a plug in that quilt tube bore, but that is very difficult. It's actually recessed in there pretty hard and it'd be very difficult to get the plug back out and to get it actually sealed off correctly. So generally the best thing to do be very cautious when installing the quill tube. All we're doing here is seating the quill tube. Once it's seated, make sure it does not rotate. That means the alignment dial is in place. Then it's time to install the quill tube nut. These nuts are completely reusable. You should not really have a reason to replace them unless they're damaged or heavily rusted. Just gonna run it in by hand. I lubricate the threads also in the face of it as Cat recommends. And then you're going to torque it to 52 foot-pounds. Now this, I should have got a ratchet or a shorter ratchet because I didn't realize how much it needed to be seated. So I was using my torque wrench here, which didn't have a very large swing radius due to the uh, nature of the Ford cab here, but we got it, it just took a while. We're doing number four here first because it's the easiest one. Speaking of fuel filters, we have our new ones on there. Cat on the secondary, the primary one, couldn't find a cat Equivalent, unfortunately, but we got a Napa one. We are vacuum filling them. I do not pre-fill fuel filters. In general, if I ever have to, I fill them from the outside and seal the inside because you want to fill from the dirty side. Using my vacuum gun there as well. Really the best way to prime these systems. Gets all the air out and pulls clean fuel through. Now you can see I've installed the rail. I've got all my quill tubes in and the quill tube nuts. We are ready to install the fuel lines, which is by far the tedious thing to do on this engine. Now, the quill tube, or not the quill tube, the fuel lines torque to 20 foot-pounds at the rail, and then annoyingly, they torque to 11 foot-pounds or 135 inch-pounds at the quill tube, and then another 60-degree turn. So that's 20 foot-pounds at the rail, which is, that's the easy part. It's really the quill tube portion that is almost impossible. Uh, you really need crow's feet here. Um, I'm sure most guys don't 
torque these, but I try to torque anything I can, if you can. Sometimes it's physically impossible to get a torque wrench in certain places, but I try, if you can, to torque it. That way, if something does come up, you did the best you could. So like I said, 11 foot-pounds there, I'm using my inch-pound torque wrench. Then it's a 60 degree turn, which is one flat, because there's six sided flats, 360 degrees. So I'm marking it here, and then we're gonna go to the next flat, which will give us our perfect torque procedure. So I'm just gonna use a wrench here since it's a turn amount, not a torque amount. And once it's at 60 degrees, you're done. Right there, and it is tight. That is way tighter than I probably would do in general, but. What we've got here is a little glimpse into a video I'm making in the future. We've got a C16 coming in, getting a serpentine belt retro from a V-belt setup. Never done one of these before. Should be an interesting video. So we're back together. We got the air filter housing back on. Notice the one fuel line is painted red here coming off the high pressure pump. That's because it's back ordered from CAT for several months. So we're gonna reuse it for now. Got a clamp on the intake. Let's fire up. So Cranky is ready to hopefully fire up without some ether now. Got my test screen here currently communicating. Hopefully it will work, not lose communication. Let's see what happens. Let's crank. All right, that was just some residual fuel in the cylinders, very common, so it's just a false start. We're gonna crank it again, see what happens. Come on. Do it! Do it! Look at that. Hey, imagine that! So, great news. We have fixed the original complaint of engine failing to start. However, this is a C7S. Remember the worst cat truck engine ever made? What does that mean? Well, it means we fixed that one problem. But, let me show you something. Now that the engine's running, we have multiple codes that were not there before when we were just cranking. So, something's going on. Need to, uh, need to look into this. So yeah, we have now four active codes, even though they're none of the sensors that I had to mess with. Two of them are on the DPF, which is eight feet from where I was working. The other two are down in the bottom of the block, kind of back behind the cylinder head. Probably about a foot from where I had to do that regulator. These are not connectors I messed with. So does the truck start? Sure does. Moving communication again. It never ends with these C7S's, I'm serious. Hey guys, so you know I'm in business when I'm on a creeper. And we're still working on this C7S. Remember it had a bunch of codes after we uh, got it running here? Gotta figure out what's going on with that. Yeah, let me show you. So we're under the truck on the passenger side here. And I was looking at the ARD head. Uh, first the CGI cooler's been replaced and it is pretty loose. This should not be that loose, that's gonna damage it. But anyway, look at this line. This is not factory. The line from the ARD head fuel lines are actually just looped. So there's no fuel going to the ARD or ARD head. That's why we have pilot and main fuel pressure problems to the ARD head. Also many other problems I see on this truck. What is that? What is that? <laughs> that is a ground wire just relaxing, not held in place on the starter. That might be one of our connectivity problems with the ECM. Might not be, but that's definitely a problem. Have to fix that. So what's the big find on this? Well, of course, you can probably guess, this is the DPF. Oh yeah, there is a six inch hole broken right through the center of this DPF. Of course, this engine had a delete and that's why they did this. They destroyed the DPF and bypassed the ARD head. Here's what happened. Prior to the county that purchased this truck, bought it, someone had deleted the regen system, punched a hole in the DPF, and bypassed the ARD head. They'd also reprogrammed the ECM to not notice this. However, since the ECM had been replaced during the troubleshooting process before I got it, it got a correct flash file, so now I was trying to regen. 
They didn't call us out there for a regen problem. They called us out there for a crank no start, but they replaced the ECM initially. Then it was towed to me. I troubleshot the fuel system, found out that the injectors are causing the crank no start condition, which fixed that. Now the engine does start. However, since the ECM now has the correct flash file, it's trying to regen, causing all of these codes, which led me to look for damage to the emission system, which is obviously there, which means now they need to buy a new DPF, get the ARD head back in order, and try to get this thing to regen. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.